<laughs> All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for Grasp on Robotics. Uh, my name is Michael Poza. I'm the faculty host for today's talk. Uh, quick reminder before we, we jump in, um, previous talks can be found on YouTube and on the Grasp website. Uh, and if you're on Zoom, you can send in questions via the Q&A uh, uh, mechanism there, uh, and we'll be monitoring that uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, if you're in person, you can uh, direct questions, and at the end of the seminar, uh, Sharon and uh, and Leon there will be uh, moderating the the Q and A. Okay, all right. So for for today, I'm super excited. All right, we have uh, Wenchen Yuan from Carnegie Mellon uh, here to uh, uh, share some of her recent work uh, with us. Uh, Wenchen's an assistant professor at CMU in the Robotics Institute uh, and has. Uh, been really instrumental in you know developing and in, in, in utilizing uh, uh, Jowsite essentially. I mean, sort of really revolutionizing how we think about tactile sensing and robotics. Um, uh, did her PhD with Ted Ed Ted Adelson at MIT, uh, and uh, uh, has, since leaving there has has a really fantastic, vibrant, vibrant lab uh, at, at CMU. So we're super excited to see what what uh, she and her group have been working on lately. Uh, and with that, I'll I'll let you get started. Thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction, Michael. And it's really excited to have this chance to come here and introduce our work uh, throughout the way for understanding how robots can better understand and interact with the physical world with the help of high resolution tactile sensing. So like many robotics people, we start our research with the motivation is that we want the robots to be more intelligent especially in the way that it can be intelligent when interacting with the physical world. So you can imagine that like a uh, you know, typical like uh, scenario like this is a supermarket. There's lots of things happening and we probably want the robot to act as a person that like uh, navigate around the supermarket, he understand what we need and grasp the vegetable or the fruit we really need. So there's definitely lots of things happening in this kind of tasks and scenarios. And touch is definitely part of important things in this process. So for example, a very typical task we may do is to pick up some avocado from the supermarket. How, how do we do that? So definitely we recognize where are these avocados with, our, with the help of vision, and we will navigate through that and grasp an avocado. But also a very common uh, question we may ask is that, is this the avocado that is ready to eat tonight or can I keep it for several days or is it too raw? that I can keep it for like a week or so, or it's already rotten, I shouldn't take it at all. So for humans, we can easily do this to touch. We can feel the textures and extend the, uh, the properties of the avocado and tell us like, it is something that is ready to eat today. So the question is that, can we make a robot to do a similar thing? So to answer this question, we take a look at uh, what kind of technologies are available for robots. So especially tactile sensors, so traditionally, robotics understanding about tactile sensing is that we want to measure the distribution of force with a, a, with a reasonable spatial resolution. So for example, this is a very typical tactile sensors that is, for, uh, that is manufactured by Weiss Robotics. So those uh, tactile sensors cover the dark blue areas on this hand, and they measure the uh, normal force with a spatial distribution uh, and a spatial resolution of uh, around five millimeter. So for example, if a human is pressing on the fingertips, so this is the result map you can see where you can see a higher normal force in the middle of the contacts and a lower uh, contact, uh, contact force in the peripheral area. So this kind of sensor is helpful for many, uh, many tasks. For example, here is a simple demonstration. Those researchers want to show that a robot can grasp some delicate objects like an egg with proper force if, they, if the robots do have a tactile feedback. So in this case, those, the sensor is telling the robot like, are you contacting the egg? What is the force? Don't crash too hard uh, to crash the, uh, the objects. So similar, there are uh, other ways those uh, sensors can help robot, not only by controlling the grasping force, but also recognizing the shape of the objects uh, on the contact areas or classifying the material by the textures when, uh, uh, when sliding on the surface. But you can see that the, the constraints of all those tasks is that what a robot can learn from touch is pretty limited. 
And the core challenge is that the information those sensors are, uh, are able to offer is pretty limited. So that's the largely constrained that what, uh, what do robots can learn from tactile sensing. So to address this challenge, we firstly proposed to build a new kind of tactile sensor called GelSight. And it's pretty special in the sense that it can provide a very high resolution tactile feedback to robots. It provides lots of more details about what is happening on the, uh, on the contact surface. So here is a brief overview about the working principle of the gel site sensor. It's optical-based sensors, and the, sen uh, the core part of the sensing is a piece of clear elastomer that is painted with a reflective membrane. So when the elastomer is in contact with an object, it may deform, and the deformation may change the reflection and the shading caused by this uh, on this reflective membrane and which is directly relevant to the shape of the object that is in contact. So if we put a camera on the other side of the elastomer and try to capture what's the shape of the change of the uh, shadings, and especially if we put a lot of lights from the, from the control directions with different colors, we can get a better controlled measurement about what exactly the shape is. And we can even reconstruct a 3D shape based on this uh, reading of the camera's image. So finally, we have all those comp optical components, including the elastomer, the reflective membrane, the light, the USB camera. We try to put everything together and make, uh, put them into a small box and made a just a fingertip sensor. And that is, uh, that is almost small enough that can be installed on a robot, uh, uh, robot gripper so that the robot can carry the sensor, move around, grasp the objects, touch different surfaces, and understand what it is touching. So another thing we have been trying to do is find those black markers on the surface and visually track the motion of those markers. And they are very helpful in telling the contact force, especially the shear force and torque. So you can see in this demo of humans uh, twisting uh, uh, his fingers on the sensor surface. And on one hand, we can definitely see lots of details about geometry. In this case, it's the fingerprint of the human's finger. But on the other hand side, since the human is twisting, there's lots of torque. So we can see those special patterns by tracking the motion of those markers. So specifically, we found that when there are different types of the uh, force and torque, the markers will make a different patterns in the motions. And the magnitude of the motion of the markers is exactly linear to the uh, magnitude of the force and torque. So that this is very helpful to tell us like, what is the, the contact force as, uh, other than what's the contact geometry? So in summary, here shows a short video about what happens, what kind of signals we can get from gel site when we are trying to contact in objects with different geometries at different locations. So this uh, window shows the raw output from the cameras in the image. So there are typically two things happening. One is the change in the color. So that is the optical response that tells about the shape and textures of the objects it's in contact. And the other thing is the motion of those black markers, which is indicated by those arrows seen in this field, and that tells about the contact force. So the interesting thing about this video is that you can see that this is my lab mate pressing the sensor on the, uh, on the objects. So we intend only to apply some normal force. But if you look at the markers, there are always a significant field of the markers uh, moving towards one direction or making a rotational pattern. So that is because humans are so bad at motion controller. We see that press on something, there's always some shear force or the torque, although it's pretty small, but the gel site sensor is sensitive enough to capture that. Okay, that's just a quick overview about how the sensor is designed and how it works. Any questions so far? Great. I hope everyone got the idea. So probably you have a same question with me. The sensor is great. It has uh, provides lots of nice signals, lots of in details about context. But how can we use those signals? How can this uh, kind of new higher solution tactile information make a difference to robot perception? So typically, definitely a simple things we can think about is that when you can see lots of textures, details about the objects, you can have a better understanding about what is uh, or exactly you're touching, what's the details of the objects you're touching. So for example, this is our earlier work uh, uh, using the tactile uh, feedback to, uh, to detect the properties of the cloth. So you can see that based on the gel site view, there's like, you can clearly see the uh, textures of different materials on the cloth. But of course, you can even see further than that by like uh, uh, or, uh, how, the, the, how the cloth will deform during the squeeze process and what's the shape of the foldings. 
And that tells not only like the texture or the type of the uh, materials you are touching, but also some physical properties like how deformable the coat is. And even like that can be connected to some semantic properties such as like uh, how, should you, uh, how shall you wash the coat. And another example is about like how shape can help robots is this. So in this experiment, we try to make a robot to grab a USB head and plug that into a, a socket. And this is a this is a task that requires lots of precision, but with the help of gel side, we can see these special textures on the uh, on the side of the USB head, and we can use that to get a very precise localization of this USB head in the gripper, and that can help the robot to achieve this task with a much easier and higher uh, higher precision. But you may ask, like. Uh, uh, other than those like uh, basic geometry information, can we see further about what is the what are the objects is and what they are like? Especially if we think back about this like avocado case, humans can know like is that avocado not through the texture, but also we can perceive the hardness of them, which tells about like this, whether this avocado is ripe or not. Is that possible for a robot to do a similar thing? So we start with a simple experiment. So we try to press the gel side on a man-made silicon samples, so you can see that it's hemispherical shape. It's actually a little bit deformable. And this is what we can see from the gel side view during this pressing process. So firstly, the interesting thing is that the contact is not a point contact. It's a, it's a surface contact, and it's a dynamic process. You can see that the sequence of the contact is growing as the contact surface grows. And that is actually uh, corresponds to the process like the, your contact force is growing larger and larger. And uh, on the other examples, we try to make another example that is of exactly the same shape, but made of uh, much softer materials. So this is the signal we can see. So it's still a, pro a dynamic process where the contact is growing, and, but the color is different. What, what is causing this difference? That is because when we are trying to press in on a, a deformable objects, it's not only the sensor deforms that make us to perceive the geometry, but also the object may deform. And the softer the object is, the more it deforms. And the more it, it deforms means that the geometry has a larger change. And the good thing is that the gel set has a, it can make a very precise measurement. So we can measure exactly how much deformation it is so that we can use this to estimate how, uh, how hard the material is when the sensor is touching it. So the other clue we found that is very useful is also the markers. So here shows again like the same examples about pressing on harder objects and softer objects with exactly the same geometries. So in the first case, you can see that there are much, motion, much more motion of the marker in the spreading patterns. So that indicates that uh, when you are pressing on harder objects with the same uh, with the same contact uh, contact uh, uh, depth or contact uh, geometries, likely you will need to apply for a larger force. But in the second case, the marker has a much smaller motion. So this is another clue to tell us like uh, the object itself is made of a softer and more deformable uh, more deformable material. So then the next question is that we know the physics is there, the physical signal is there. How can we correlate that into a, a numerical measurement of a hardness level of the objects? So we tried different methods and finally found that the easiest way is to run a neural network. So we build a network structure like this. It's a combination of a convolutional neural network and recurrent neural network. So we get several frames from a contact sequence where your contact force and contact geometry is growing larger and larger. And we feed, firstly, feed in each frame into a convolutional neural network, which uh, give us information about spatial information in the frame. Typically, it tells about like the geometry of the contact and contact force, which it can be indicated from the marker's motion. And then the information flows into a re recurrent neural network, which tells about like how this information changes as the time goes. And finally, it will output a single number tells us like the uh, hardness level of the objects. Okay, so there's a question about like, how do we train our network? So we actually collect a physical data set uh, where we made a bunch of silicon samples using the materials we know the hardness and using like a bunch of uh, shape, uh, shape, uh, shape mode so we can control the shape as well. So we use this as a, to get uh, to train our network. Mm -hmm. 
So question. So the question is like, what is the output? Is that a single number or a classification? So we are actually doing a regression work here. So the output is a number. So here shows the result of the network output. So we try to test the case with like objects with unseen hardness or unseen shapes or new contact mode. So it, it generates a reasonable response in all the cases. And especially we consider like the avocado cases we have, which we have to be thinking a lot. So in this case, uh, we don't really have a ground truth. So we ask a human to rank two avocados from soft to hard and collect some gel cell data on them and try to output the hardness level uh, from the contact. So you can see that although we don't have a good knowledge about whether how precise it is, but the estimate number exactly matched the human estimation. Okay, so that's the part of uh, estimating the hardness of the objects don't touch. And the other thing, uh, the other thing, property we have been looking at is, uh, is perceiving the properties of objects in an indirect way. So we, are, we start thinking about like the liquids in a bottle. How can we estimate like the properties of liquid in the bottles? So the natural thing we would do is to shake the bottles. And as a human, we can feel lots of vibration with our hand. And those vibrations tell us about uh, lots of information, such as how much, about, uh, how much water or liquids in the bottle, and what's the property of them, especially how sticky are the liquids. And the question is that, how can we make a robot to do a similar thing again? So we try to start with the simplest uh, case of shaking. So just like uh, gave us uh, uh, impulse, uh, impulse stimulus to the liquids, uh, to the liquids in a bottle, so you can see that this, this stimulus will cause lots of vibration of the liquids in the bottle. And the vibration patterns will vary a lot according to the physical properties. So we try to observe those vibration patterns with a gel site sensor. We make the gel site to do the same things, collect the tactile data. And we found that there's lots of vibration can be captured by the motion of the markers. So we try to uh, uh, reduce the dimensionality of the data and get the motion of the markers in a pattern like this. So it's a very beautiful damping signal. So we try to just uh, make things easier and fit the damping uh, functions over the signal we collect. So uh, then we can fit, uh, fit a simple model like this. So in this process, we find that the two parameters are most important. So one is lambda, so that describes this decay rate of the signals about how fast this vibration will die out. And the other thing is uh, omega is a frequency, is how, uh, how fast your uh, your liquids will damp around, uh, will move around in the bottle. So that's actually uh, can generate very different results when, when we ask a robot to shake different kind of liquids. So here we try to do the same things, shaking a bottle of water, oil, detergents. So the just a signal, if you look at the raw data, it's not much different. But if you try to look at this, like a uh, uh, reduced dimension, uh, redu uh, uh, data with di reduced dimensionalities, so you can see there's a lot of difference in the, like uh, those two parameters. So we try to use only those two parameters to do a, classif a classifier to try to see whether we can see the difference of the liquids. It works very well. You can see that there are, uh, the three kind of uh, liquids are different like uh, very significantly. Especially if you can, see, uh, you can see that like the data points is uh, distributed like uh, along, a line, uh, along a line distribution. That is because we are shaking the bottle with different frequencies, uh, with different volumes. And it turns out the, uh, uh, the distribution of the data, especially along the frequency field, exactly uh, corresponds to the volume of liquids in the bottle. Questions? This is very cool. Uh, I was curious to know, do you actually need to use the spatial resolution of the gel site for this, or was it just averaging over the forces measure the everything for this? So that's a great question. So uh, you got the point. We are actually reduce the uh, spatial resolution a lot or the data dimensionality of the sensor. But through our early experiment, we found that like there's a big advantage of using gel sizes. The measurement is much pr more precise. So we also compare the results by using a force torque sensor on the wrist. So there's still some difference, but like the quality of the signal is not as easy, uh, good. Especially if we're thinking about some the, our next task where we want to do a very fine discrimination. So we are, my student will make a bunch of uh, a bunch of sugar water that is water dissolved with a different concentration level of sugar. And we, again, we do a similar shaking and collect some gel cell data and see what is the temporal signal is like. 
So you can see that the difference is much smaller, but still there's a difference. So try to fit uh, Gaussian models to uh, on the, on the data we collected, especially try to predict the height of the liquids in the bottle and the sugar concentration level, which is directly corresponds to the viscosity of the liquids. It fits, it fits pretty well. And here shows that what happens if we use this uh, model to predict like the two parameter, parameters of the uh, 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 of this liquid uh, liquids in the bottle. Okay, so that's the end of the parts of estimating the properties of the objects. Any questions so far? Good. Okay, let's go to the next part. How we can use gel set signals for manipulation? So I'm going to use the simplest examples grasping. So this is the most common task and most well studied and most well well used things for robot manipulation. Question? Yes, I have a question. So I wonder, what are the factors that control the mass of the liquid, mm -hmm. the volume, of the liquid, mm -hmm. and what the shape of the bottom is? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's a good question. So the question is about like, uh, what are the things we are controlling in these experiments? Uh, whether it's a uh, mass or uh, volume or the shape of the bottle. So firstly, we don't have any pre-knowledge about volume of the liquids in the bottle. That's why you can see that in this here, in this graph, uh, in this graph, we are predicting the volume, or in other words, it corresponds to the mass and the uh, weight of the liquids in the bottle. And the other thing is that I'm not showing here, but we do have an experiment with what happens if we have like a uh, bottles of different shape, different properties. Definitely, that will change the parameters of the. Uh, of the model, the, uh, firstly, the physics is still the same, and the signal, the, the type shape of the signal is pretty similar. But like the model itself is a little bit different. But it can be easily transferred from the previous model. Like if we transfer to a new bottle, we just collect a very small amount of data and fit a new, new surface and fits pretty well. Good. Um, so you have this model for how we think today, and uh, what are, what is the level of Anything in the signal that you're measuring with respect to all the various properties that might be of the liquid, like properties of containers, the, the mm -hmm. mass, the density of the liquid is probably mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's a good question. So it's like uh, uh, it's asking about like uh, what kind of properties that may influence the response of the uh, uh, signals and the models. So first, they definitely the, the property of the of the bottles. Actually, we experiment with multiple bottles with different shapes, different weight, and sometimes it's a, a plastic bottle, sometimes it's a glass bottle. You can imagine it's very different than on the physical property as well. So as I said, like physical property is similar, it's just the shape of the model is kind of different. So on the other hand, uh, uh, we do think like there are many other properties that may. Uh, of the liquids that may affect the results, such as like the densities or like the viscosity levels. So, for example, what happens if we work with the very sticky liquids? So, how, uh, so it's, it's not covered in the current study, but it's definitely something very interested in the future. But like uh, uh, through our experiment, we believe that the viscosity and the volume are the two major influence influencing factors in this shaking pattern. Okay, let's go forward. To this new topics on grasping. So we know that grasping, there's lots of things happening. So firstly, you probably want to use a camera to recognize what are the objects, where do you want to grasp. Then you need to have a robot that help you to move around, go ahead to the objects you want to grasp and close your gripper to get the objects. But the next step is that you want to understand whether your planned grasp act as expected, as, act as planned, whether your grasp is successful or not. So this is typically achieved by using the tactile sensors on the fingertips or on the hand to tell you that what is the result of grasp. Is that a successful grasp or not? So we're trying to see whether we can help. So this is a setup we are looking into. So we start with a simple settings of parallel gel grippers, grasping objects in a very boring way. <laughs> okay, not boring, a very common way, about lifting objects vertically. But we are looking into like what happens if we want to grasp a, a wide variance of objects with different uh, geometries, different materials, and different weight, and uh, different uh, surface properties, such as frictions. And we want to see whether we can get a common solution to this, especially if we figure out that like the most commonly seen grass failure type is lit. So the question may turn out to that, like, can we use tactile sensors to effectively detect slip during the grasping process? And in all those common cases, 
So this actually has been a long, uh, long standing challenge in the field. And there are typically two pretty classical solutions. So first the example is that we can detect slip by uh, estimating uh, measuring the uh, vibrations from the contact surface. And the second idea is that we can uh, predict slip by measuring both the normal force and shear force and measure whether it's uh, within a friction point. But you can see that like, you know, the, the biggest challenge for those existing methods is generalization. So especially in the, uh, in the real world case, what if the objects are of some unknown shape and we are grasping some objects at some locations with some contact situations that is not expected anymore uh, at all, or the surface friction is unknown, which is always the case. So can we get a generalized solution to detecting those failures mode of grasp? So we start uh, by uh, start our exploration by using JOSI again and try to see what we can get from with a JOSI sensor. So firstly, we try to experiment with objects like this, which has lots of uh, uh, geometries. Of course, we can see lots of geometries for, uh, on the contact surface with the JOSI feedback. If we're uh, grasping this model, so we can see an edge and the small corner. I think this corresponds with the, uh, the horns and the elbow of this small girl. And if we take a really close look, we can see lots of details about the geometry and those black markers. We know that they are painted on the surface of the sensor. And we ask the robot to grasp the objects and lift it a little bit, wait a little bit, and take another shot of what, we happen, what happens on this contact surface. And this is what we can see for the second, uh, for the second peak. So you can see that this uh, geometry has moved for several tens of pixels while the markers remain almost at the same location. So what does this mean? So this actually means that there has been some relative displacement between the objects and the surface of the sensor. And that exactly matched the definition of slip. So we know that this, this object is already sl sliding a little bit on the surface of the sensor, and it's likely it will continue sliding and finally fail from the gripper. And this is, a, this is a feature that helps us to effectively detect this kind of slip called translational slip. So in other kind of cases, when we try to grasp some objects that has a very long shape, common thing will happen is called rotational slip. So this, the idea is kind of similar. So we can see the geometry of the objects. So we wait a little bit, but in this time, we can see there's a rotational pattern of the objects instead of like translational motion. And this is another case like indicates that the object is likely to slowly slow, uh, uh, rotate away from the gripper. And this will cause the failure as well. So you may ask like, what happens if we're grasping some object has almost no texture and you cannot see the geometry at all. So the good thing is that we can still see the motion of the, geom uh, the markers where we expect there's lots of shear force causing the markers move towards one direction. And when the force is small, they are moving uh, for a uh, smaller distance. Uh, when the force is large, it will move for a larger distance. But if you look very close into this, uh, this comparison of the two figures, it's not only the magnitude changes, it's also the pattern changes a little bit. That force is pretty even. And uh, in the second case, when the force is large, you can see the marker is spreading out. Also, the magnitude is not the same. It might be easier to see the change of magnitude distribution if we make a heat map. So this is what happens if we have an increasing shear force and we're grasping some flat surface objects like this. So at first, everywhere, the marker moves with the same magnitude, but as the force increases, sometimes there's a, a, a difference between the markers in the peripheral area and the central area. And this uh, difference will grow as the force grows. So why does this happen? So this is because when the force is large, the slip will happen, but it doesn't happen immediately on the entire surface because your sensor surface is soft, just like a human skin. So this slip happens from the peripheral area. And this uh, slip area will cause the disattachment between the sensors and the sensor surface and the objects. And that will cause the difference between the motion of the markers in the center area and in the peripheral area. So in other words, if you try to measure the uh, inhomogeneity of the distribution of the markers within the contact areas, so that can give you an indication about like how much this attachment of the sensor surface and objects, and how likely this object is going to like uh, slide away from the finger surface of the fingertip. 
So finally, we have those two clues. One is the uh, one clue help us to detect like the objects with lots of textures. The other one help us to detect the objects with almost no textures. We, we combine the two uh, two features together, and we can predict like a, a slip cases when grasping objects. Uh, we are grasping a bunch of different objects you know, over like uh, eighty percent of the time. We also try to indicate, uh, use the features in a, a closed loop grass control uh, frameworks, where we ask the objects to, we ask the robot to lift the objects, but if slip is detected, we will regress the objects at the same location, but with, with a larger force until it finally lifts the objects successfully. So with this mechanism, the robot can lift the objects successfully in like 89% of the cases. But in this uh, experiment, we also find that rotational slip actually happens a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, especially when we are grasping some objects that is longer along one axis. And in those cases, we, do, we, can, we can secure the grasp with a larger force, but it's actually not a very good solution. Because even though the torque, even when the torque is very small, uh, the, local, the local shear force could be pretty large. And the best solution is not to increase the force, but it's to find the location of the grass that is closer to the centroid of the objects and try to reduce the torque. So we try to uh, study how we can do this. So we, again, we can measure the torque of the grasping easily with the, if we are trying to measure the rotational pattern of the markers on the process sensors. And we try to calibrate that with an external uh, ground truth measured by camera. It turns out to be pretty precise. In the other case, uh, if the object itself has lots of textures and there's not a lot of markers within the contact area, Again, we can track the contact areas and try to measure how the geometry rotates. So in general, that can give us a good idea about like how much the torque is and whether it's a dangerous case, we try to avoid. And we can also use uh, integr integrate that detection results in a closed loop uh, grasp, uh, grasp uh, framework that we ask the robot to navigate along the major axis of the objects and we find a location that has a very small torque and we are, the robot can grasp the objects actually with a pretty small force. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so we found out that in general, uh, uh, we prefer to have a small torque. So sometimes it's, if even it's not a uh, rotational slip case, a big torque is not preferable in many cases. And if you're thinking about the torque on the point of view of the sensor instead of on the objects, so it's actually pretty uniform. So it's re relevant to the objects. It's just like by measuring the angles and the distributions and uh, combining that with the physics of the sensor, you can estimate the torque. So we try to simplify the model, especially in that we want to make it a very quick response of the robot. So we just try to measure the angle and use a bunch of grass experiment to decide like some angle is a, is a dangerous threshold and we will use that threshold to control the grass. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, so this, uh, so the angle itself is a pretty uh, pretty reliable measurement. So we done uh, we done a bunch of experiment by measuring the angle. So here we didn't transfer that to the torque for the experiment per, uh, uh, for the experiment purpose, but like the angle again like is directly relevant to the torque itself. And this shows like uh, we can measure like the real time angles of the rotation and predict the real time force change. Okay. Okay, so that show, shows like our understanding about what happens during if the graph fails and uh, uh, what kind of feature and physical uh, physical clues we can use to detect graphs. So of course, uh, some uh, another way to solve this is, this challenge is through data driven methods. So this is a collaboration with uh, researchers from Berkeley, including Dinesh. Uh, so uh, we try to build a large data set with, with geo site and vision feedbacks and grasping a bunch, a lot of data, uh, a lot of objects, much more than the objects I, uh, I collected on my own. And 
it, it gets a good, uh, good, uh, good prediction of whether the graphic success or not. But we find that like uh, the biggest challenge here is that we need to collect a lot of data set, like over 900, uh, over 9,000 grad student trials. And it turns out like it's really a pain for the grad students who are forced to do this work because they need to sit there watching the robot to do the entire, repeat this process for several days and the robot will occasionally just do something weird. The, the, the students need to fix that. So we find that like uh, in general, this is not a sustainable solution. So actually this is uh, like a, pretty common challenge for many learning tasks in robotics is how to get more data more efficiently. So of course, you probably want to, uh, the first thing pop up in your mind is simulation. So instead of experimenting with a real robot, you can do the experiment in simulation, which typically traditionally was used to help you to verify your system, like whether your system will work well, whether your algorithm will work well on some traditional ro robot tasks. But nowadays people also find that it's a very simple solution for, to help us to easily collect a large scale data set and train a deep neural network. But like, there's still like, lots of challenge on the simulation side, especially like how can we make the simulation to act in a, in a way that more closer to the real world physics, especially like the feedback of the sensors. And there's a, also a big demand about uh, get, uh, building a simulation model for tactile sensors. Uh, and we try to do that for gel site. So the first thing we look into is that whether we can build a simulation based on understanding about how gel site works. So we just talk about the principle of gel site that is an optical sensor using the reflection of optics to get a feedback of, uh, about the geometry. And if you open these sensors, it's actually made of several components, including a supporting, uh, supporting structure, a camera, some light, and uh, this surface. So it seems that like we can simulate the sensor by just simulating how this optics works. So we use this technology from graphic community called physical space rendering method. So the basic idea is that we try to track every single ray, ray of the lights happens within the sensor. So we know that the lights always come from the LED and shine on the sensor surface and got, then got reflected through the camera. And we try to track a single, uh, single ray of the sensor and uh, see how they, uh, how they got reflected. And some of the reflected light will enter the camera and contribute to our pixels in the camera's image. And then we definitely uh, sample a bunch of lights and finally form an image that's similar to the uh, image forming process with a real camera. And in this process, there's lots of challenge about characterizing the properties of the optical components to make sure they act exactly as the root uh, uh, exactly, it's very similar to the real components. Uh, I'm going to skip the details. We made that happen, and finally, we got all those simulated parts uh, in this uh, in the simulation environments and the, assemble them and try to reconstruct like what we can get from the camera's output. And here is the result showing that like we can get a good estimation about the uh, the gel set image, regardless of where is the contact areas, what's the shape of the objects and even what's the shape of the sensor. So this method uh, is kind of a physics space. And uh, uh, the good thing about this is that it can provide a very uh, insight about how the optics works within the sensor and why the sensor is providing a good, uh, good, uh, good measurement about the geometry. And since there's a physics space, we can even use this to help us to get, guide to a better design in the optics and better design in the sensors in the simulation environment. So for example, this is a question we are being thinking. So can we make a sensor, vision-based sensors uh, with a soft robot? So some of you probably have seen some videos like uh, uh, what it's like with, with a soft robot hand, soft finger, which is uh, deformable all by itself. We can imagine designing optical sensors for this kind of uh, robot fingers is super challenging because everything is deformable and the geometry of it is very uh, challenging. And traditionally, uh, sensor design may go, may go through a trial and error process, which may take a lot of time. But now we have simulations. So we can try to, we try to make the design simulation, which like uh, greatly reduce our, uh, uh, our pipeline of design in the sensor. So uh, this is still ongoing work, but our idea is that designing a gel site for, this, uh, for the soft rose finger. And of course, the biggest challenge here is optical design. And we try to play with a lot of bunch of uh, different designs in simulation. And uh, 
once we figure out what is a good design simulation, we try to reproduce the design in the, uh, in the real world and try to apply that on the uh, robot hands, which you can see that it, although it's a very preliminary result, it can still like, uh, give lots of information about the detailed textures of the objects it is grasping. So this is one way for simulating the sensors. We also find that there's a, it's helpful in some way, but the constraint is that it's not acting very quick and it's not very practical to use, uh, to be used for the large scale data collections in the, uh, for the robot data. So, uh, so we, look, we start to look into another path use, uh, using a data-driven method. And this time we try to use a lightweighted model called example-based method. Uh, method. So it's still trying to learn from data, but we try to use only a very small data, a set of data for calibrating the sensor and build a simple model. And the good thing is that uh, the, since the model is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty lightweight, so it will work very fast and very easy to calibrate. So uh, the model is still based, uh, built based on the principle of the sensor, but we try to simplify that into a statics way instead of, uh, of the physics way. So for example, like we know that a sensor is built a measurement of geometry based on the measurement of the, uh, based on mapping the uh, surface normals of each pixels into a intensity of the pixels. So we, we try to simplify the correlations with the polynomial functions. And then we just try to characterize those uh, parameters in this uh, polynomial functions by collecting a bunch of samples like this. Where, the, where we use a known ball containing the, uh, containing the sensors at different locations. And once we figure out those parameters, we try to apply that on any unknown new geometry. It actually works pretty well. So you can see that the comparison between the real image and contacting different objects and the simulated one is pretty similar. And the good thing is that since it's a very simple polynomial mapping, so it works very quick, even only working on a GPU machine, CPU machine, we can reach a speed of like uh, around 18 frames per second. It also works well for some objects with uh, lots of detailed textures or can be easily applied to another sensor. So this is a digit sensor developed by Facebook people. Uh, the optics is very different. So we also did uh, like, we use the same model, but did uh, uh, collect a bunch of similar calibration data with the sensor. And you can see that it can generate the simulation results kind of reasonable compared compare to the real signal. So another thing we try to uh, simulate is the motion of the markers, uh, which we know that is uh, 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 it corresponds to the contact force, especially the shear force and uh, the torque. So here we try to uh, approximate the, the estimations using a uh, uh, the motion of the markers by mirroring the elastomers deformation using a linear superposition method. So I'm going to skip the details since I guess no, not many people are interested in the mechanics here, uh, but generally here is our result. So we can see that we are testing the sensors on objects with different shape, with different combination of the normal force and the shear force. We can simulate the motion of the markers in a pretty reasonable way. So now we have the simulators, it works pretty fast and we try to use that uh, on a robot so that we combine that with the robot simulators in, uh, in PyBully environment and try to revisit our uh, old task on grasping. But this time we try to do a, use a data-driven method to predict the re grasping result with the job site data. And instead of collecting the data set in the real, uh, real world, we try to replicate the robot settings in simulation and uh, and try to make the robot grasping objects at different locations with different force. And here's some example of the grasping results. So you can see that uh, the on the one hand, the sensor simulation is uh, very si uh, generate very similar results as the real sensors reading. On the other hand, we also try to calibrate the physics of the contact between the sensor and, uh, and the external objects so that it can uh, the, the predicted results of the grasping is very similar in the real case and the, the simulation as well. So then we just use this collected data set to train a network and apply that on the, uh, on the real world data, uh, robot grasping experiments. And here is the result. So in short, we experimented with uh, uh, 12 different uh, objects and on each one, we only use 100 to 150 data points for training and they are all transferred to the real object grasping and then we can achieve an average success rate for 
uh, for uh, as 80, 86% and 91% based on whether we want to use only a single image as an input or a sequence of tactile signal as the input. Okay, so that's the end of my talk today. So as a quick summary here. So firstly, I introduced the design and working principle of a gel size sensor, which is a pretty special since it can provide very high resolution signals measuring the geometry and contact for standard torque. And then I introduced how we can use the gel size sensor to estimate different properties of the objects, such as estimating the hardness of the objects by pressing or estimating the liquid viscosity and the volumes through uh, impulse shaking. And at last, I also talk about like, uh, uh, then I'd also talk about how tech, uh, gel size signal can help with manipulation tasks, such as in-hand localization or detecting grass failure cases, especially for translation and rotational slip. And at, uh, at last, I talk about our efforts about simulating the gel size using either a physical-based method or example-based method, and how that can, be, uh, can help robots in the real world to like uh, easily collect the large data set and train a learning model. Okay, last I would like to thank all my collaborators on all this work and thanks to my uh, sponsors and thank you for listening. Sure, I guess I, I get the first question. Um, so uh, maybe I'll see where you can see me. Um, thinking about, you know, you showed the ability to potentially detect slip, mm -hmm. right? even disambiguating slip from large shear forces. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there are use cases in robot manipulation mm -hmm. where you need or you'd really benefit from mm -hmm. like a higher frequency sensor, um, mm -hmm. say something like the Gakoski and how kind of vibration frequency, or do you think everything we really need can be gotten at the gel site frequencies with that mm -hmm. higher spatial resolution, but lower temporal? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. It's also a question we have been looking, thinking a lot with my students as well, like whether we do need a high frequency signal. So actually, this is a, there is a foundation of this question about like from uh, psychophysics studies about how human touch things. It turns out like human do use high frequency uh, sensing a lot on the fingertips. So especially uh, we use that to detect friction, uh, uh, not, not friction, slip. Let me see, shown like one of the earlier slides. So this, this work, you can see that it's pretty early it's in, in 1980s. So those people try to use only like a, one accelerometers in the in the subject fingertip to detect slip. And signal is very strong. And they got inspiration from, uh, from human's fingertip because humans dominantly use uh, uh, vibration to detect slip cases. And another example of human detection is a uh, uh, material. So like uh, if you try to find the, uh, recognize the textures on the, of some material, Human don't do things like jaws and like pressing on the surface, get a very high resolution map. But what human do is that we will slide on the surface and we feel the vibration and we try to understand the vibration. So uh, I think in the early ages before jaws that happens, uh, robotics people trying to do similar things using vibration signal, especially for detecting the textures and uh, uh, yeah, textures of different materials. Uh, there are some results, but definitely not as good as gel size since we have see very high resolution signals. We have been asking that what happens if we have high resolution signals and uh, high spatial resolution and high temporal resolution. So we have an unpublished work. So one of my students is trying to build a uh, very high frequency gel size sensor. So we use that for, uh, for multiple uh, multiple perception tasks. It seems that it's not as effective as, they expect, uh, as we expected. So we're still trying to learn more about like how this kind of signal is helpful, but like it's an unknown question. But on the other hand, I think if on the robot system side, so there is always a big demand of a robot to respond to the external change very fast and to reduce the latency. And I think this is the, uh, uh, this is the case, like uh, if we get a very fast signal and we uh, reduce the latency, that should be super helpful. Uh, can I? Uh, sorry, I have a hard time. 
change configurations for the sake of the students. I should remind you that the first tactile sensor used in robotics was done here, Peter Allen, in 1979, used a tactile finger where he showed where vision cannot work, the touch will complement the data. So just for historical reasons, thank you for the review, it was nice. I have done many of those things as well. I am surprised you are at Carnegie Mellon and you are not working with Roberta Klatsky. Oh, we had lots of discussion, but not directly. Has been who has collaborated with us together with Susan Lederman, quite well-known psychologist, in addition to Ted Adelson, whom we know very well. Very nice, thank you. Thanks very much. Yes, we had lots of communication and learned a lot from her. This was great talk. Uh, um... Uh, very uh, fascinating, uh, uh, like also the design, obviously, but uh, also how do the sleep work? Uh, how do they sleep? Uh, did you play with the position of the LEDs inside the sensor when you were doing the physical, the when we were doing the simulation work, whether there is an optimal positioning of the light sources in oh. terms of uh, computing, like the even the vector field? Or, yeah, that's a very good point. So I think that is um, uh, for for the simulation and simulation guided design part. Uh, the main focus is to figure out what is the best design, optical design. In other words, is the configuration or position of all the optical parts. Uh, yeah, so this is something we'll try to do a lot in simulation. And especially we're also looking for like whether we can do it in a manual way or automatic way instead of uh, manual tuning. And uh, it's still ongoing. Oh, uh, oh, sorry. Do you mind if I? Okay. Uh, there's no uh, online question, so I'm just going to um, take dibs on my own question. But yeah, thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, I was just wondering for, um, so you've shown that the gel site is quite capable of um, doing this sort of binary slip detection. I'm wondering if you can say more about um, under slip, can you actually track the relative motion uh, during that slip? Um, maybe by tracking the geometry um, mm -hmm. in the deformation, or I guess if you had some translucency and maybe you were unlucky and you couldn't catch some geometric edge, um, maybe you could do optical tracking of like uh, mm -hmm. visual patterns on the surface of the object or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Like whether we can track the geometry of the objects during slip. So for the grasping task, in principle, we can definitely do that. But like uh, in practice, uh, in practice, the major challenge is the system design. Uh, it's the response of the uh, robot is the latency of the sensor. So usually when slip happens, it's actually from the visible range, it happens in like a sub-second, or I think it's probably 0.2 or 0.3 second level. And for our sensors, so since we didn't optimize a lot on the uh, frequencies and the latency of it, so it's pretty challenging for the robot to respond through it in time late for that. Uh, so that's relevant to Michael's question, like uh, whether it's, uh, there's an uh, advantage of using high frequency sensors. So we believe that if it's, that's a really, uh, uh, that's really a uh, concern. So like high frequency sensors is uh, very beneficial. So another case is that like uh, sometimes in some manipulation tasks, not really slipping, not really grasping, people do want to make slip happen, actually use the slip. So this is another task. I didn't talk about this, but it's one of our working submission. We try to uh, do a cable routing. So a lot of them means like the robot need to follow the cable. So this is also a similar. Uh, this is also an earlier work about like cable following and cable routing by Ted Ayerson's group in recent years. So the idea is that we can use this to use the gel side feedback to detect the uh, contact areas, and we try to actually slide along the cables, and we are using those geometry to guide the robot to slide along. So I think this is another case, like it's not really aggressive, like we need a very fast response of the robot, but like the slipping and the, uh, the geometry information is really helpful. Um, first, thanks uh, for the great talk, Benjamin. Um, so I, I'm a fan of the gel side style sensors, right? Uh, and uh, 
but given the context of we've had kind of a a CMU plus tactile sensing week here at Penn actually Abhinav came a couple of days ago and gave a talk on his reskin sensors and he extolled the virtues of having kind of full body sensing mm-hmm. you know, over large surface area and so on uh-huh. and i wanted to kind of pick your brain on have you been thinking about how to extend this kind of high spatial resolution together with maybe having many more sensors maybe mm-hmm. over a larger area mm-hmm. how does it work together with complex geometries etc mm-hmm. uh, that's a good question whether i'm thinking about like using whole body sensors so uh so this is like uh, some work on the area of whole body sensing and some works about like uh, proposing how to build sensors. So firstly, I should say that different people have different understanding about like what is required for making a sensor and uh, uh, what kind of sensor is really helpful. So my personal understanding is that it's, it's really helpful to have a sensor covering a large areas. Uh, but like there are some practical challenges, especially on the system side. If you have a sensor covering a large areas, uh, the wiring and signal processing, there's a great bandwidth. So it's not very practical to build a system. There might be some good solution, but I'm not the expert in this field and I haven't seen any like uh, any promising information, but let me know if someone has some new advantages in hardware to make this happen easier. So I think like a compromisation in this is that we want to find a combination of different type of the sensors. So ideally, I guess like a, a good compromisation is that we use a high resolution sensor like a gel side or camera based sensors on the fingertip and traditional low resolution sensor covering the largest scheme. So especially based on like the, uh, the contact area and the request of contacts. So in most part, the part of the human body, we actually don't need the very high resolution tactile sensing. So I have another ongoing work submitted, so I'm not showing here. Uh, so we are actually using uh, computational fabrication uh, technologies to make a native sensor that can cover a larger area. So the good thing about that is that it's a pretty deformable and which have very high customizabilities to cover a large area. It's customizable sensitivity, customizable uh, spatial resolution, and also wiring is relatively easier there. So I believe this is a promising direction to go uh, to look into, like because a special sensor is a can be make a very flexible sensor in customizable shape and customizable uh, spatial resolution. But yet we are still exploring here, and I really value the opinions and uh, suggestion from every other uh, from all other people. Hi, um, I was wondering if you think this could this type of feedback could be helpful in um, not just grasping uh, a particular object that you're sensing directly, but using a tool to grasp another ob- to grasp or manipulate another object, like mm-hmm. having a robot use a screwdriver mm-hmm. or write with a pen on a piece of paper or mm-hmm. tweezers to pick something up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Tool using. Yeah, we have been thinking that, and yeah, there are lots of exciting. To, uh, uh, topics we, uh, people can work on, and we definitely need time to work on, and definitely I work, uh, welcome other people, all the researchers to work on tactile sensing together. So definitely, I think like uh, using tools is a, a very important thing, using tactile feedback, especially as human, we do that as well. So uh, in those cases, I think Jaws do have lots of advantages, especially the ability of mirroring the normal, uh, the shear force and the torque, which happens a lot like uh, when you try to control, uh, understand what happens with the inter- external interaction with the two and the environment, and uh, what happens with the contact, and how do you react to that? So uh, in this case, I think like if we use the feedback, like uh, indirect feedback from the sensors, that can help us a lot of like, understanding what's the state of the tools and how we can use them. Um, hi, great talk. Um, so I'm curious about the closed loop uh, c- controller experiments that you showed. How fast uh, is the controller there, like the control loop rate? And this goes to like my second question of uh, in most of these experiments that you're showing, you're grasping uh, objects that are basically passive, yes. that are not moving or they're not deforming. But yeah. Could we use these this sensor with this frame rate, for example, mm-hmm. to control a robot to make contact with an object that's deforming or that's moving like a human arm, like mm-hmm. a human hand? Uh, or do we need in those cases a higher frequency? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. So I should accept that. If you look at this video again, you may notice that it's a 2.5 time. So uh, 
we are not very good at making the system. So like a big challenge in our system building is that it's the delay of the sensor and the latency between the sensor and the robot system. So in this case, where in most of the closed loop design, we're trying to use a quasi static case instead of dynamic case. So we're trying to like understand the signals and wait, wait a little bit for the robot to processing things and let the signal flow through the, uh, flow through the surface and actually to re react. So I think this is uh, one of the, our current constraints, but we hope like through those experiments, we can show the idea like uh, the tactile feedback can provide some uh, useful feedback to the robots regarding to uh, how to react to the, uh, to, the, uh, to, uh, to the contact situation. But in the future, I believe like if on the industry engineering level, there's lots of uh, improvements on uh, uh, making the loop to flow much faster, reduce the latency. So, there should be lots of new uh, possibilities about like using the tactile signal, especially dynamically. So on the other hand, we didn't look a lot about like uh, different, uh, the uh, control or manipulation with the deformable object cases, but I do believe like, uh, again, like we can do the perception, it's just like how we, uh, the challenge is like how we can design this uh, closed loop control control algorithm or control framework. So then we can do something, especially like controlling the force so that we're not squeezing the objects or whether we want to like uh, uh, touch the whole uh, uh, body of humans in a safe way without damaging the human body. So I think there's a lot of all possibilities in those fields. Um, I have a quick question. Firstly, Professor, thank you for that wonderful talk. Personally, for me, this was a really new topic. So I learned a lot from today's session. So my question is, um, for most of the examples that you showed is the avocado, the, the objects that are picking, or even the clothes for the for deciding what kind of wash the clothes should be used for. Um, I noticed all of them have the same texture throughout. So have you tried or do you have any ideas of how you would manage, for example, clothes with different textures and then deciding what kind of machine wash goes for those kind of clothes? Oh, uh, yeah. So it's, I didn't show it here, but it's uh, in our paper. We try to do some experiment like uh, understanding what's the preferred wash methods for the clothes. So actually we have a video about robots storing the clothes in different baskets with machine washing, uh, with different washing methods labels. So you're, you're welcome to check that out. Uh, hi, I'm very curious about like the slip detection part. Mm -hmm. Like you just mentioned that you detect, detect slip for like if there is an excessive translation or rotation of the markers. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just say that maybe the, this translation and rotation, they are somewhat proportion to the like shear force or the torque. Mm -hmm. I, I just wonder if there is any possibility that you can construct a very accurate ma mapping from these translation and rotation with the shear force and torque. If that is the case, it will be, it will be very interesting because you are making like a surface force sensor. Mm -hmm. you know? is, is there any possibility mm -hmm. like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a great point. So uh, I think uh, this is not exactly on the slip cases. It's like a, oops, the basic understanding about uh, how the sensor works. So I get a simple conclusion here is that it said that it's linear to the magnitude of the force and torque. So I got this is from the experimental measurement. So I conducted lots of experiments and measuring what's the force, what's the magnitude of the markers. And it turns out to be a linear correlation. But it's not a simple linear correlation, and there's a big, a big influence by the geometry of the objects. So if you're contacting the sensor surface with a different geometry, the response could be totally different. And especially sometimes it's a combination of the things. And if you want to go back into the physical principle about what, like why this is linear, what's the motion field, what is the response of it? So it uh, actually goes to the field of the solid mechanics of a deformable objects, which is really, really, really non-trivial. So we found that like, if you really want to get a good precise solution to that is through a finite element, but it's definitely not preferable since it's super slow. So in one of our periods where we try to train a neural network that by collecting lots of supervised data of using different shape of objects, contacting the surface and measuring the force and estimating the force based on the, that. So it kind of works. But on the other hand, we may ask like, whether it's worth it. So I would say that like, uh, it's possible, but like in many of the cases we use, we find that it's not really necessary to get a very precise measurement of the force distribution field. Of course, there might be some new ideas or new application popped up and 
I'm welcome to talk about uh, those new styles of, uh, and new possibilities. Um, I have a question. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, so I have a question about the um, scalability of the gel site uh, sensor. So how easy is it to for you to basically just line them up in like a for a bigger surface mm -hmm. or line them up in a non planar um, a configuration so that you know um, I guess in the gripper mm -hmm. um, case you have like one on each side. How about like I guess four on like the four four sides of the object. How easy is it um, to uh, configure in that way? Mm -hmm. Good point. I guess you work on computer vision, right? <laughs> yeah, this is a big difference between vision and tactile sensor because in vision, the simple thing is that you can get a large scale data set. You can cover a large space very easily. But for tactile, what you can get is local information. If you use some nice sensor of things like JOSA, you can get a very precise measurement, lots of details of a very, very small patch. So you may ask like uh, whether it's possible to cover a large area. So uh, it's possible, but not easy. So sliding is a uh, not a preferable way for soft sensor due to their constraints in the physical, uh, physical design. But if you do like individual touch, that will take significant longer time than you expected. So, uh, there have been discussion, for example, like a uh, recent development of people you doing a rolling based sensor, like, like a roller, you can roll on a bigger surface. I believe this is a good solution to what you're proposing. But in general, uh, my personal thought is that a good solution to this is com combination of vision and touch and use vision for a global level of info uh, information collection or modeling and use touch for only local level and try to reduce the, uh, uh, re reduce the time of touching uh, touch sampling using like probability model models or other models so that you can get an efficient solution. Uh, there's one Q and A question uh, from the online audience that I'll read aloud. So Christopher Kim asks, is there a reason behind how the black dot markers are in different shapes? If so, what is the reason? Uh, that's a good point. So at first when I designed the sensor, so this is the very first version of the markers we made. Uh, I actually made the markers in the shape of triangles and try to uh, uh, try to randomize their distribution. So my uh, my uh, my intention is that if you have lots of randomizations, so, so you can use the distribution pattern to get a more precise uh, more precise or higher resolution tracking of the motion of the markers. And if you track the deformation of a, even a single markers, like how it stretch, how it uh, expand, so that can give you a higher uh, precision of the estimation of the motion. So unfortunately, so far we are not using that information so far. But I believe, like if at some point we be, uh, we really need to like get a very high precision or high resolution tracking of the markers, those information can be used. We want to add some like uh, more geometry information to the marker themselves, but like. Uh, so far, we found that those even a simple, uh, simple design of the marker patterns will work well. Uh, thank you for the talk. So I have a question about the spatial temporal information that you're, that you're using. So I like the fact that you are using both axes, but I think using the temporal information also introduces some, uh, you know, like some complexity, mm -hmm. especially that you are using like RNN, right? So yes. it assumes that things are consumed at fixed time intervals. So how would the network, you know, like generalize to like different kind of time durations as well as like different speed of how the information is being collected? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing is that if it turns out to learning, so lots of things are, th I'm not expert about. I'm not, I don't know what is happening in the neural network. Uh, but my understanding is that if you can't get your data set, uh, data set very, uh, like uh, it's a wide distribution good enough, so you can learn a lot of the information that invariant of the contact patterns and the speed. For example, for this particular task. So actually when we collect the data, so we collect it with a human, uh, with a human contact first. So we intentionally try to control the speed of contact with a human. And uh, so sometimes we ask a human to press really quick. Sometimes we ask human to press a little bit slower or even with un uneven speed. And even for the pre-processing, we try to like uh, 
uh, use some like pre-processing method to even uh, to like smooth out the selection of the frame we use in the entire surface. So without uh, without those efforts, we hope to like reduce the influence of this uncertainty of the contact uh, patterns or trajectories influence. So uh, I believe it works uh, uh, kind of helpful. So one of the experiments showing here is that the training data is collected by human contact and the test data is collected by robot is pretty different considering like how human would press and how robot would press. It's not only the trajectory, also the distribution force of a normal force and the shear force. So we believe like it's kind of helpful. I have one maybe last question since it seems like there's no more. Uh live or in-person questions um just for the uh um like the center of mass sort of uh uh detection or like grasp um regrasping work i was just wondering um i think i might have missed some of the mechanics but um could you i have a similar question that dinesh asks like um could you have done the same thing with just a simple force torque sensor mm -hmm. um and knowing that like i guess if you're grasping above the center of mass mm -hmm. then there should be no torques and then you just know which direction to move mm -hmm. like is the high resolution information giving you more like uh, mm -hmm. yeah uh so that is certainly relevant to this experiment of uh, adjusting things with torque uh so in this in this experiment the torque measurement understanding what's the direction of the torque is super important to help us to understand where shall we navigate. Of course, the magnitude of the torque is also helpful. So the biggest challenge here is that most of the tactile sensor I know cannot measure the torque. Even the shear force is very challenging. So if there's no information about the torque, so it's very hard to do like the uh, regrasping methods like in this particular case. But you may ask like what happens if you use a force torque sensor, six axis force torque sensor. I believe that is possible, uh, especially in the principal side. But uh, in practical, in practice, I heard some people complain that using the ATI nano sensor, like the fingertip one, is expensive and it's very fragile. So that's probably that's the reason why no one else using that. But I think, like in principle, that is also doable. All right. Uh, thank you again for for that wonderful talk. Um, and we'll thank the speaker one more time. Thank you. As we wrap up, before we shut the Zoom down, uh, I'll thank everyone in the, the inner, uh, remote audience as well. Uh, and uh, next week, uh, next Friday, uh, excited to have another fantastic speaker. It'll be Radhika Nagpal from Princeton.